Hello and welcome to the Armour Men's Health Show. This is Dr. Mystery, your host, board certified urologist, host of this show for almost three years now, joined by my co-host, Donna Lee. That's right. Welcome, everybody. Um, have you heard our podcast? We have over 122,000 downloads. I'm glad that you remembered that number. I just memorized it yesterday. How many times have you downloaded it? I download it all the time. 121,000. That's First. Especially those two of you in South Korea that listen. That's right. I really love that. We, we paid them, but they're good. <laughs> they're they don't good. understand a word we said, but, <laughs> but they know. I hope they don't get laid off from the recent Google layoffs. So oh, we'll true. try to keep them, keep them on board. <laughs> this is the Men's Health Show. The show is brought to you by the uh, urology uh, practice that I put together in 2007, NAU Urology Specialists. Uh, Donna, how do people become patient of ours? You can reach out to us at 512-238-0762, our website for this show and our amazing services, armormenshealth.com. See Dr. Mystery's smiling face there. And you can call us again, 512-238-0762. We're in Round Rock, Dripping Springs, South Austin, and North Austin in Texas. If you're listening on the other side of the world, like our guests. So uh, we are joined today by uh, a urologist who I uh, first encountered uh, when he was a fellow at Baylor College of Medicine. For those of you that uh, are regular listeners, you know that Baylor College of Medicine is the finest institution both <laughs> to train uh, physicians and to train uh, future uh, urologists. Uh, Dr. Kenneth Kernan, uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Ken. Hey, thanks so much for being on. I, I'm really glad to be here. Why don't you tell us where you're at and what do you do? Yeah, sure. So I'm in Michigan, where it's, you know, 20 degrees and cold and snowy, like it always is up here, not warm where you guys are. And uh, I'm a, uh, a urologist who's primarily specializes in oncology. Um, I'm in a big group called the Michigan Institute of Urology. We're about 50 partners or 50 doctors with some physician extenders. And I also run research for our group. University of Michigan also has the second best football team in Texas. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> I don't know anything about University of Michigan. I'm a Sparty, so go Spartans, go green, go white. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And so, uh, you know, you, you deal with a lot of urologic issues, and uh, enlarged prostate is one issue that we deal with um, uh, quite frequently. Uh, and I think most people are uh, familiar with the fact that medications are a very common way that we deal with it. Um, in our practice, we try to deal with some behavioral and supplement kind of approaches. Why don't you tell me what is your first line or second line approach to enlarged prostate? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is is exactly what you said. Most men initially, first of all, they may be embarrassed to talk about it, right? So they just think, oh, this is what happens to me as I get older. I'm just going to live with it. And I think part of what you're doing, which is so great, is actually educating people that, hey, if this is a problem, we have lots of ways to fix it. You don't have to just live with it and put up with it. So a, a lot of that first discussion is, hey, you came to see us. How much does this really bother you? Um, and if it does bother you, let's do some testing to see what's going on. And then obviously we offer 10 off of first line therapy, like some medications that kind of opens the prostate up, or as we joke with the guys, opens the donut hole up so they can urinate a little bit better. And then that second line therapy may be something like, you know, one of those, one of those medications that actually shrinks down the prostate. And then we go right into talking about some other options. So I'd like to talk about a little bit just about those medicines that shrink the prostate. These are going to be medicines like finasteride and dutasteride. In my practice, I don't use it virtually at all. I feel like the risk of sexual side effects and I just hate the hormonal manipulation that's happening, but not all urologists have the same opinion. What is your own opinion of the use of finasteride and dutasteride and, and, and uh, what kinds of patients do you uh, use that medicine in? Yeah, right. That's a really good point. I think you have to be careful because, you know, there is that risk of sexual side effects, erectile dysfunction, loss of libido, which obviously that's one of the first questions is, hey, how, how important is that still to your life? And if the answer is, hey, that's still really important, then again, like you, I would shy away from that. Um, you know, obviously I have a older, a little bit older practice sometimes just because there's a bunch of old guys up here um, that are coming to see us. And I think it's not quite as critical for them. Um, so we do offer that as a, uh, an option, but anybody who's still really sexually active, I, I'm like you, I shy away from it for that reason. My favorite patient is the 80 year old that's coming to me because he's wondering why he lost his erection. So, uh, so in terms of that kind of concern, even for the old guys, we're kind of in it to win it. Um, yeah. 
when it comes to the standard medications, those are called alpha blockers. There are three that we use very commonly, psilocin, tamsulosin, and alfuzosin. There are some older ones that are still on the market. What are some of the side effects of these medicines that you traditionally tell people that they can expect when they use it? Right, so that's a good point as well. Is there are some side effects even with those medications? Um, you know, one of the things we worry about is, you know, they can have a little bit of dizziness or they can, they can um, kind of drop their blood pressure. Um, obviously, retrograde ejaculation, some sexual side effects with that or with, with any of those three. I personally tend to lean towards alfuzosin because of the uh, decreased risk of, of retrograde ejaculation. Um, even though I joke with my patients that unless you're making movies or making babies, it shouldn't be a big deal. Um, it does bother <laughs> some people. So uh, I tend to use alfuzosin first just because of the retrograde ejaculation. Now, uh, when, it, when it comes to explaining what retrograde ejaculation is, uh, number one, I think all urologists use the same analogies to explain why it's not that important. But 20 years ago, I never would have thought I would have had so many conversations about somebody coming. Uh, but if, <laughs> if, you were to, if you were to explain to somebody what they can look for and why it's such a big deal to some people, what do you usually tell people? Well, again, my standard joke is unless you're making babies or making movies, I don't know why it's a big deal, but it does bother some people, I, I would assume, for a variety of reasons. So we tell them, look, when you have an orgasm, instead of the ejaculate coming out like you normally was, it just goes into your bladder and you'll urinate that out later. I think in some men, psychologically, it bothers them. Honestly, sometimes it bothers their partners. Um, and then... Again, some, some men say it does change the sensation a little bit. So, I mean, isn't that the truth? Sometimes their partners are bothered by the fact that they didn't orgasm as if a man was somehow faking it. Right, right, exactly. Like the old Kramer episode in uh, Seinfeld. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, but recently we've seen more and more uh, data about the long-term negative impacts of these medications, including some cognitive impacts, maybe the long-term kind of uh, fatigue. And I, I think it's true. I think that men that stop their alpha blockers sometimes feel better uh, because maybe their blood pressure was reduced a little bit. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, we, we definitely have seen that as well. Um, the other thing that we have, especially if sometimes these are guys who are still really sexually active, we will lean towards giving them low dose to Dalafil on a daily basis. And that sometimes will help them as well. It doesn't obviously as work quite as well as, as some of the alpha, the true alpha blockers, but that's a way to kind of skirt that issue a little bit. So um, that's going to be like five milligrams of Cialis they use every day. It'll give them both some benefit on the urinary side as well as rock hard or rock star erections. And that's something that we really encourage in a lot of our patients. Yeah, I mean, it's the ultimate guide drug, right? Helps your erections, help you urinate better. And if it just would help my golf game, it would be something that they probably put in the water. It'd be so, the trifecta. <laughs> so when it comes to surgery, we've had the traditional TURP where we use a, uh, uh, an electrified metal loop to cut the tissue. What are some common side effects that with that treatment that patients kind of were scared of and are, you know, we'd like to avoid? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Obviously, technology has gotten better across the board, even in those standard transurethral resection or TURP. TERP procedures, but, you know, when people go on the interwebs and they go to Dr. Google, you know, they're looking at old technology. They think they're going to get some roto rooter and they're going to have a catheter and be in the hospital for days and things like that. But, you know, whether we're using a laser or an electrified loop or electrified button, you basically are coring out that middle of the prostate, like coring out an apple or making that donut hole bigger for patients. Um, so obviously there's retrograde ejaculation, there's bleeding, there's potential for infections, all those things that go along with with any of those, those procedures. So, um, you know, in an effort to um, kind of reduce the, the likelihood uh, of those side effects, uh, there's been a lot of interest in technological revolutions to kind of um, reduce the risk of bleeding or retrograde ejaculation or uh, other potential side effects. But if your doctor were to recommend a standard TURP, how afraid should patients be that uh, they're going to suffer some kind of bad complication? You know, for, for me anyway, I actually use um, a button. So I'll do a loop and then a button. So when we're done, we actually take that bipolar button and basically seal the entire K 
cavity or fossa. So we actually do all of our patients now as an outpatient. So they, they all go home the same day. They normally just have a catheter overnight. Um, so that to me has been a great benefit or improvement from a technological standpoint. The downside is though, they're still gonna have retrograde ejaculation. They're still gonna potentially have some sexual side effects with it. So we haven't, we haven't, we haven't skirted that problem, but from the bl significant bleeding standpoint, I think that bipolar technology has really made some great strides. So the, the, the kind of horror stories that even though 99% of people will have a perfect experience, the one horror story he'll tell everybody, um, which is that he had to go back into the hospital because of bleeding or had to have prolonged catheterizations, those stories are becoming less and less common. Correct. Right. Like anything. I mean, again, when they go to, they go to Dr. Google, they're going to find those horror stories a lot easier than they're going to find the, the modern technology that what we're doing. But yeah, I mean, everybody worries about that, but, but frankly, we just don't see it very often, but, but I do think there may be a fair amount of urologists out there still doing monopolar terps, you know, like they did back in the day, you know, and so they're getting, you know, hyponatremia and winding up in the ICU and all that crazy stuff. But Hopefully there aren't too many urologists doing, uh, doing monopolar terps. Excellent. Well, Dr. Kernan, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're going to have a small break, and then we're going to talk about some very new, exciting technology. We'll be All right. right thank you.